The Gray Mojave is an endless, wrinkled, mountainous landscape with large stretches of gravel and little sand. It is jagged, a windswept desert. Its pale gray can darken intensely or change like a chameleon, depending on the color of the season and the daylight. When we think of gray, we think weak illumination. We associate the color with a lack of warmth and dull. The Mojave can be cold in winter, unlit in the night, and appears dirty, as the minerals in the crushed rock, gravel, and sand are not yet weather-beaten, not yet washed out from the stone. Everything can be included in gray. Copper, manganese, uranium, and mica. Everything on display is visible on the artist's palette in Death Valley. From the light gray breaks, a true fireball of pastel colors. Pink, green, azure, brown, silvery white, and violet. If we increase the magnification of the gray sand, we get a similarly multicolored image. The Mojave is sparsely populated. Even though three million people live there, large cities have emerged in specific areas, Las Vegas, Palm Springs, and Lancaster fashionable resorts and pensioners' paradise. I'll ignore these because humankind has stepped in and stolen the land from the desert. My journey heads out into the wide open desert. There's a big black hole in me in the center, yelling, Help, please help, please help. It's dead and street in the heart of winter. We're only the Situated on the leeward side of the Sierra Nevada, a mountain range that blocks the moist air coming from the Pacific, and the summer temperature rises to 106 to 113 degrees. Occasionally, an abandoned gas station lurks on the roadside. Rusty metal billboards creak, or a house falls into disrepair.
Ruins of a spa and a beach resort from the 1950s in the abandoned region of the Salton Sea, the largest lake in the United States that is actually drying up. The investors had promised an American Riviera, but a disastrous chain of bad planning, continuous flooding and silting, and increasing salinity of the giant puddle without a drain made a ghost town out of a boom town. What the future of the Salton Sea will be, no one can predict. It may disappear one day as suddenly as it appeared. Money has become scarce, especially for studies and environmental issues and low-income regions. Millions of dollars have already been poured into the controversial aid program. Billions would be needed. One after another, the nostalgic charms of the 50s are disappearing. California. This is a little hotter than what I'm used to down the, by the beach where I come from, but you, you know what a house costs right here? You know what I pay for the house? $18,000. $5,000 down, $500 a month for two years and a $1,000 balloon payment. And it's mine. You can't even buy a car that cheap, can you? I found a beautiful woman and she was adopted and her mom lives out here and lived out here back in the 70s when they had bars and they used to water ski and everything out here. But they had a big like hurricane and a flood and it wiped everything out. And as you can see, everybody just kind of walked away from everything. I think it's gonna be a popping place in the next five years. Like I say, 18,000 here or go to Riverside where it's 90 degrees, 95 and pay 365,000. I think that people will start moving out here pretty quickly. So that's my predicament. Because as times get harder, we got to save our money, right? Well, if the big earthquake comes, we're all going to kiss our ass goodbye and say, see ya up there somewhere. Or maybe down there. Hell, I don't know. You know? But yeah. Both are happy in Bombay Beach. And they are, as crazy as it may seem, not an exception in the Mojave, where this desert draws in the artist, outlaws, miracle believers, visionaries, UFO fans, and other eccentrics. Leonard Knight belongs among the most unusual inhabitants of this region. The hermit has created Salvation Mountain over a span of 45 years. 15 years ago, my old Chevy dump truck broke down here and I didn't have no gas to move, and I had no finances to build nothing, and people started to love me a little, and I started pounding the mountain here without a plan. And uh, 14 years later, I'm still here, and people are still coming in wanting to hear a love story about loving each other. He has worked tirelessly and transformed an inconspicuous mountain into a place of pilgrimage, an object of art, does he consider himself an artist? I never considered myself an artist, but people think I'm one. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that people love what I'm doing, and I'm glad that people respect what I'm doing, because the more respect I get, the more I'm gonna tell people is love God and love Jesus and let's respect everybody in the whole world. And... He was respected. Outside near Slap City, a former military base on whose slaps concrete foundations, outlaws park their mobile homes and set up drug labs. 
where graffiti and vandalism are on the daily agenda. This is my first 54 dump truck. 14 years ago, more or less before I came here, I spent 10 years making a hot air balloon, 200 foot high, and I wanted to put God his love on it. I have a one track mind. I want people to love God and God love people and I think it's happening. And it rotted out on me right here and I put the God is love mountain in the mountain. And I said, well, my hot air balloon didn't work. It rotted out, so I'm gonna have to do something different. It's not just a mountain he has adorned with hearts, flowers, and a waterfall, and on whose dome he erected a cross. It is a tribute to God. There are vaults, tunnel passages, and stairs, built from what the desert provided or what visitors and donors brought, paint, clay, and straw bales. A guardian angel watches over the offerings and recalls the early years. Here inside, like in a hogan or sanctuary, the memorabilia is protected from the bleaching sun. He painted and repainted his universe. In the desert, he found himself. The sparseness and the denial helped him gain a new feeling for life. Leonard dedicated his ascetic life to God. His truck never drove a single mile again, but it protected him from the biting cold or the scorching sun and wind of the extreme climate. I'd like to have you look in here. We will. Yeah, you young people can look. I'd love to have you open the door. And be real careful. I'd love to have you look in there. That was back when I was young and had ambition. And I really wanted to decorate everything. I ran into a tremendous lot of love and respect on people. People come in now by the hundreds, and I've never had one person get mad at me or anything. People just seem to love me, and uh, sometimes I'm kind of hard to love, but I'm working on it. <laughs> While these eccentrics on the eastern shore of the lake eke out a gray, barren existence, in the northwest, lush green plantations spread out. Jasmine for perfumes, lemons, oranges, and especially dates. They often spill their over-fertilized and untreated sewage into the lake that has no outlet. One farm has specialized in medjool dates, which were once exclusive to the royal family of Morocco. The family that owns and operates Oasis Date Farm has set a new standard. They farm organically. Driving on anthracite-colored heaps of gravel in the lowlands of the Joshua Tree National Park, we reach the Jumbo Rocks, the huge granite rocks that originated in the subsurface magma, and finally, with the onset of the arid, dry climate washing out to the surface of the earth, they lay still. California is part of the Pacific Ring of Fire, an active earthquake zone in which 75% of all volcanoes on our planet are located.
The granite shows very strange seams, which look almost artificial on the round stone, as though painted on as an afterthought. They are quartz veins. The plant that grows only in and is characteristic to the Mojave is the Joshua tree with its narrow, twisting arms. The second typical plant of the Mojave is the Choya cactus. Because from a distance it looks flush, it is also affectionately known as the teddy bear cactus but the plush stops if its microscopic little spines remain stuck by only the slightest touch in your own flesh. The choya simply releases these hooks and leaves them where they do not belong. The rest of the vegetation is bristling, thorny bushes that more or less cover the ground, depending on altitude and attribute. At sunset in Keys View, the Salton Sea sparkles below us in the distance one last time. It is a glorious feeling to be up here, frightening at the same time, because the bottom of the Andreas Fault runs through here, the fault responsible for massive earthquakes. During the night, the Airstream trailer nestles between large, round, polished monoliths, the jumbo rocks, and Joshua trees. No light from nearby cities. Here and there, a star flashes, and I wish I could see a shooting star fall from heaven or a meteor shower. Coyotes howl that night. Pioneer Town is not a ghost town from the time of the gold and silver rush. A film set has mutated into a city. Sets, however, were more than facades. They were real buildings. Terry Paul was a young hairdresser with a penchant for romantic desert stories who knew the location because of a girlfriend who was a makeup artist. What is remaining here um, when old westerns became uh, passe in the 50s? They unincorporated this area, sold out to the public. And then you had to be able to bring your buildings up to code or they would tear them down. Main Street used to be full of buildings on both sides of the street all the way down. Unfortunately, in the 60s when they tore them down because people couldn't bring them up to code. Some people bought them, made one bedroom homes out of them. Um, over the years, I just was fortunate enough in 1992, I bought the first log cabin and the caretaker's house. And then, then I got to buy more property and more property, which is how I ended up with um, this four acres that I own of part of the old movie set. This entire area is not a place that you live because you're stuck here. Um, this is a place you live because you see the beauty in the Joshua trees and in the dryness, and then the, you have to like the heat. <laughs> Basically, Pioneer Town is ran by all females. We have a female um, postmaster and myself who I'm called the Land Baroness because I've got four, five rentals along this street. The new owners were chilling on Main Street, talking, looking, holding a beer, some wine, a joint. They took certain liberties. They were on private land. This is our private party room where we allow the reenactors to come in and we have a couple of kegs of beer and we just have a good time. Everybody has to be dressed in uh, at least 1860 to 1890 costumes in order to come into the bar and uh, partake in the, in the festivities in here. 
I'd like to introduce you to Gayla. She's been a dear friend of mine. She was donated, her and her husband were donated to our saloon um, about mm, 11 years ago. And uh, unfortunately, some of the cowboys didn't like Jerry around, so Jerry no longer is with us. And Gayla is left and she lives here in the saloon and she's the uh, watcher over and all the cowboys just really enjoy having her around. On weekends, visitors storm in, in Pioneer Town, especially with children. They want a breath of Western atmosphere and a look behind the scenes of the former movie set. I lived here for 10 years and uh, finally got tired of having to deal with um, bringing my water up because our water is non-potable. It's got arsenic in it, so you're not supposed to drink it, so we have to cook and eat with or drink bottled water. So um, I just got really tired of it. So I moved down to a country club down in Desert Hot Springs. So I've got heated swimming pools and um, nine hole golf course and jacuzzis and natural mineral waters. And I'm as happy as can be down there. <laughs> it's a great place to, this is now a great place to visit. And I do come up at least two times a week. Buying into a piece of history or an adventure is not uncommon in the California desert, where UFOs land or huge rocks split open. Years ago, back in the early 70s, I had the opportunity to go up underneath the rock. And it wasn't split at the time, it was one great big huge rock. But there was a gentleman, he was a German, so the story goes, um, that had built his home underneath the rock. And you actually could walk under the rock and you, he had a living room, he had a bedroom, he had bookshelves, and he had a bed. And everything was, was carved out of the rock. It was very, very fascinating and very interesting. Um, we never got to meet him, although it's kind of a mystery because I don't know whether Van Tassel was actually that German or not. Van Tassel has never admitted that he was the German guy. But when you spoke to him, he did have a German accent, and he was German. So, if, you know, you kind of have to sort of wonder about that one. He believed very strongly in UFOs. And he would sit down and tell you stories for hours and hours about how he went up into the spaceships and all the rides that he'd go on and all the experiments that they did with him. Back in the late 60s, they had a UFO convention out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. There is 25 to 3,000 people, and they're everywhere, literally everywhere, and they're all sitting there, and they're all looking up at the sky, waiting for the UFOs. No UFOs ever came, and they dispersed at the end of the weekend, but it's a sight that you just never forget. The gray-brown split monolith under which the former test pilot and self-proclaimed aeronautical scientist Van Tassel is said to have lived, but who certainly stayed in contact with the UFOs, has fallen prey to vandalism. Graffiti adorns the almost 66-foot high rock, the once mystical site of the spacecraft conventions. In the 70s, the government filled the underground rooms with cement and demolished the private airstrip. Among the highlights in Van Tassel's life was boarding a spaceship from Venus, where he claims he learned how to rejuvenate cells. We stop briefly at the Integraton, the generator he constructed in 1953 intended to influence human cell structure. Many have made a pilgrimage to this wooden cathedral modeled on Moses' holy tabernacle that is located on a geomagnetic vortex to heal ailments. Others come for rejuvenation or meditation. And then there are those who, like its designer, see the human body as a battery and the integraton as a battery charger. There's a big black hole in me in the center, yelling, help, please help, please help. It's dead and street in the heart of winter. We're only the wicked one. We're only the Drop it, it, quickly. 
There's a big black hole. Can the desert, with its cumulative energy from the sun and wind, guarantee the future of humanity? Apart from the giant wind turbines, the energy industry invests primarily in pioneering solar systems. First providers have already gone on the power grid. Science and technology have always been at home in the Mojave. In addition to eccentrics and dropouts, it's also the playground for inventors and visionaries, not to mention the military and Marines in 29 Palms, China Lake, or at the famous Edwards Air Force Base. The legendary Mojave Air and Spaceport is our next goal. Chuck Yeager took off from here to break the sound barrier. Virgin Galactic and x run their space flight tests from this location. But before we look to the future, we pay a visit to the aircraft graveyard. Gutted passenger aircraft and worn out jets have found their final resting place. This is where change is happening. We have a saying around here that we think that this is the best kept secret in the business. We can see the future from here. 20 years ago, nobody could have guessed that a space travel test station would arise from a small desert airport. With her knowledge of fiberglass, Marie Walker landed a three-year contract with NASA, then came race cars, military and medical science. She models aircraft noses and repairs huge windmill blades. Young, 22 years old, hey, let's start a company. You know, let's, uh, you have nothing to lose. We had no car payments, no mortgage payments, no kids. Uh, it just made a lot of sense to uh, do something like this. We're rocket fans out here. We like rockets. Everything we do here, we eat, breathe, and sleep. Uh, the f you know, just thinking of the future and space travel, and it, it's just, it's real exciting where, you know, you're not limited in your dreams and your visions, and this is where people come. People come to Mojave Airport to make those dreams come true. For the adventure with Virgin Galactic, six first-class passengers with window seats each tourist will pay $200,000. x offers a trip as co-pilot in a glass cockpit. This ride costs half as much. Mike Massey, a member of the x team, sees his work as a mission. We are following a path that those government programs have blazed uh, to uh, put people into space more affordably uh, and make it possible for more people to go. Check one, check two, check three. Anybody who has an interest in space, uh, anybody who has an interest in science fiction, I would like to give them a, a new perspective on things. From space, you can't see borders of countries, you can't see walls, you can't see fences. You, you know, the Earth looks pristine from that altitude. And seeing that and seeing the curvature of the Earth and seeing this beautiful blue marble that's all by itself in the blackness of space, it changes your perspective into realizing that, you know, hey, we're all together in this. It's all one Earth. Space flight's inspiring. What really inspires our customers is, is the opportunity to do what they've seen astronauts do to this day, uh, day and age. They get to ride a rocket into space, which already is a tremendous experience. You're experiencing G-forces on your body that you would never experience in, in your day-to-day -day life. For example, on Spaceship Two, during while the rocket motor is burning, is about three and a half times the force of gravity you experience on the ground normally forced into your body. A suborbital flight with feathered wing flaps would be the fulfillment of a childhood dream for Enrico Palermo. The young Australian is the director of the spaceship company, 
a subsidiary of Virgin Galactic. Release, release, release. The next pass is really the majesty of space, uh, the blackness of space, the thin electric blue line of the atmosphere on Earth, and the zero G, so the ability to feel unencumbered uh, without gravity as you, you float around inside the cabin of the spaceship. And one of the things we often hear from astronauts that have travelled to space is the effect and the appreciation of the fragility and of our environment here on Earth. Both companies have joined forces with tour operators. Both sell tickets. They see the Mojave as a test site, but not as a tourist gateway to the skies. XCOR is thinking about Caribbean vacations that might be spiced up with a space flight. Virgin Galactic has built its own spaceport in New Mexico. I definitely would like to take a ride in a spaceship someday and, and ride on spaceship too, but I just decided I got to thinking, maybe not the first one. I'm a little chicken there, but yes, I would definitely love to to fly and see the horizon and see the black sky with all the stars, yes. The idea of space hotels and orbiting habitats is not too far away. I would say in the next 10 years, you're gonna see something like that. After that, I would say, you know, settling of planets and things, that will come uh, next. Once we have established waypoints in orbit and between the Earth and the Moon, uh, places where we can uh, refuel, propellant depots, things like that. So there's this whole infrastructure that we kind of need that we haven't, uh, that we haven't built up yet. And uh, if we don't do that as a species, uh, we're probably in pretty big trouble because the next big uh, dinosaur killer asteroid that comes along is going to be a people killer asteroid. And uh, if we don't have anybody uh, offshore, so to speak, um, colonizing Mars, colonizing the moon, uh, then you know our chances of surviving as a species are uh, much slimmer. I don't know how I ended up here. It's where I believe the good Lord meant for me to be. Um, but it has a mystique. While people work on their private programs and their secret projects, I don't see too much of the competition. They're all unique and they kind of have a niche of what they're doing. And I'd have to say that that's probably the general feeling and the atmosphere around this amazing place, Mojave Air and Spaceport, in the middle of the Mojave Desert, in the middle of nowhere. We're not close to any big cities or anything. I absolutely, 100% believe there is a direct connect between God and our space program here at Mojave Air and Spaceport. He puts the inspiration in our heart that gives us that adventurous spirit, that spirit to go and explore things that we can't see. It's the way the human mind works. We always want to know how things work and we always want to push the envelope and we want to go beyond what we can see, hear, feel, touch. Um, yes, I believe God is, is the inspiration behind all of this. While Marie, Michael, and Enrico dream walk through the galaxies, Deanna Long describes her encounter with space aliens 
here in remote, lonely Trana. Around 11.30, I'm walking down this bike path here, and I see a white pickup truck parked next to a bunch of uh, set up lights surrounding a hole that uh, someone, whether the government or whether a, a local company had been digging. Um, it was very dark out, there was no moon. I, I don't think there was a moon, no, there was no moon. And um, I was almost parallel with the truck and as I got, as I'll face this direction and um, I see this white pickup truck and I see something moving very fast in the truck and I'm like, it looked like a person headbanging or something. And I was telling myself, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm seeing an alien. I'm sure I was, no, I was not a druggie then. I've, I've tampered with drugs with bad people at times, but now I was, it was really something I saw. It was no, um, like, hallucination. I kept my eyes on it, and I just started walking backwards, and I was just, like, staring at it, like, and, you know, and it just kept staring at me. And so I got about 30 feet away, and I started to create a diversion. So I took off my top shirt. I had two shirts on. I took off my top shirt and started swinging it around, and I was yelling, praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise the Lord, because I was very scared. I've seen them on TV. <laughs> I've seen portrayals, people that say they saw them. They look, okay, it looked like a oval head. It had teardrop eyes. It had two dots for the nose and a skinny little mouth. It had a torso that was just like a human's, but only very skinny, very defined. It had very skinny arms. I saw it from about here up. I saw it from about the stomach waist up. It had a little tiny six pack. It did, like muscles. And um, it was definitely an alien. It was bald. And uh, it was staring at me, and its head was moving as I was moving. I think it possibly could have been locked in the truck um, by people who may have captured it before. Uh, that sounds crazy, but there is a base just right over the mountains. There's crazy stuff that goes on out here. I've seen worse than that alien. That's what happened. I, I, I got around this curve over here about a quarter of a mile up and I still just, my heart was still pounding. And there was no other cars on the highway, nothing. It's very dead out here at night because there's not very many people, but literally that's, that's what happened. Uh, saw an alien, pretty cool. So aliens are real, I think. <laughs> and I do think that there's probably some uh, hidden knowledge of them around this California desert. The stories of secret missions, flying saucers, and staged moon landings refuse to go away. Then a sign abruptly interrupts my thoughts. Futurism meets the past in Trana and the wind tries in vain to enshroud the small dying town with a cloud of white borax dust. A drive through the gray nothingness, distance and wind, Death Valley looks like a miniature version of the entire Mojave in a smaller space and almost without any inhabitants. Only 24 people live on 96,875 square yards, Native Americans of the Shoshone Timbisha tribe. The Airstream trailer from the Panamint Valley slowly winds its way up the steep hills into the second huge valley, Death Valley. The lowest point is 282 feet below sea level.
Nothing sings, nothing flies, nothing moves, not even a car. With each step, we go deeper into the sand dunes. We enter an almost eerie silence. From a distance, the Barkhan dunes appear sharp, but if you come closer, you see how the constant movement of the drifting sand blurs the lines. The fine light gray sand has ripple marks. They tell you the direction of the prevailing wind. The bright color of the sand, greatly enlarged, is a mix of gray and brown with green, blue, yellow, and even red. And the sand grains are not made of identical material, nor uniformly sanded, so they are still young. And then something is lying there, like upward curling porcelain shards in the sand. A plant is often right in the middle. They are dried out pools of fresh water. The light and shadow is dramatic, and finally it gets brighter, the tip of a flame in a sea of stones. The rising sun is a must see on Zabriskie Point, the full moon setting an unexpected, rare encore. On the other side, the Badlands, V-shaped gullies caused by erosion in soft sediments, an indication that a lake had once filled this valley. Today, roads run every which way through the National Park. An old hotel in the Furnace Creek Oasis from the time of Borax was restored and converted into a luxury accommodation. Respectful memories of the miners and mine workers are vivid, of people who crossed this deadly country less than 200 years ago, searching for a better life and California gold. We reach Badwater, the lowest and hottest spot in America. The dried out gray white salt bed in Death Valley holds unearthly beauty. Octagons, intricate salt crystals, organic looking structures whose cold white color makes you forget for a moment the furnace you are standing in. White clumps of grass flicker like burning candles. After a long, lonely ride through anthracite-colored landscape, we reach black and white scenery. The intensely dark concrete gray suggests a volcanic origin. When looking into the Ubihibi crater, then again, completely unexpected, there are colors. We leave the dust raised by the mirages and Death Valley behind us. Pahrump, Nevada is our final destination. We meet Ron Wayne, the third founder of Apple, who had a great financial fortune in his hands, but didn't want to keep it. Hello? Yes? 
Yes. Coins? Yes, of course. We'll see you then. Thank you very much. Bye. I was 40 years old at the time, and Mr. Jobs and Mr. Wozniak were in their 20s, and they were whirlwinds. It was like having a tiger by the tail. And uh, trying to keep up with them, uh, and what I suspected they had in mind for me as a participant in the company, I felt that if I had stayed with Apple, I would probably have wound up the richest man in the, in the cemetery. As soon as the Apple Computer Company was formed, and Steve Jobs went out and sold a uh, hundred computers to the Byte Shop, which was a retail outlet, uh, he also went out and borrowed fifteen thousand dollars in order to buy the supplies to fulfill that order. Uh, I also found out that the Byte Shop uh, had a very bad reputation for not paying their bills, and if they had not paid for the computers, uh, the, I, uh, the, co the company would have been on the line for the fifteen thousand dollar loss in which case I, as part of a company, not a corporation, would have been liable for 10% of that, $1,500, and I had no idea where I would get the 1500 Again, while I was absolutely certain that Apple was going to be very successful, but it was also going to be a, a, a roller coaster. These kids, uh, Jobs and Wozniak, uh, were perfectly capable of riding that roller coaster, but I, I didn't feel that I wanted to uh, I'd been on that ride once, and I thought once around was enough. Lack of an appetite for risk after a bankruptcy and the pace of the hungry young partners drove Ron to leave the trio after only 12 days. Didn't he feel that something important was about to happen? And how has he come to terms with the fact that he now lives on welfare, even though he had the chance to become a billionaire several times over? To be absolutely candid, I have never regretted the move. Ron is a pragmatist. His hobby is to deal in stamps and coins. He has dogs. If he lets a stranger in his house, he locks up and gets the gun out. My reason for backing away from this very exciting enterprise had to do largely with whether or not I was psychologically able to handle that kind of very uh, dynamic uh, activity. In addition to which, uh, my interest in what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life was focused on product development uh, in various fields, uh, mostly whimsical fields like slot machines. One-armed bandits still hold him captive. Ron gave up on hitting the jackpot a long time ago. Only a few hours away and still in the middle of the gray desert. Glitter, neon, and high rises. Las Vegas, the artificial megacity in the Mojave Desert, reminds us that we are in America, the land of dreams and illusions, and not yet on other, more distant planets. <laughs>